We? <laughs> All right, you're good to go. You're alive. <laughs> <laughs> you're starting to help by hitting one of your fellow members. I don't think that's appropriate for live TV. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a regularly scheduled meeting of the Wareham School Committee, but tonight it will be primarily a workshop hosted by our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Jen Vitella. We have a, sm a small number of, of uh, items on the agenda get before we get to the uh, workshop. Uh, the first item is the, uh, the process by which we approve our um, invoices to be paid. Um, at the last meeting, we discussed this briefly and we uh, decided for the moment to stick with the three signatures for each invoice and, uh, and those would be gathered during the course of the week and hopefully we would conclude that process by Friday so that the town accountant could have it um, to put into line to be paid. It has uh, come to my attention um, after reading the uh, note from the town accountant that there perhaps is a better way to handle this because it is quite possible for the school committee to designate one individual um, and, um, and that of course could be um, changed on a regular basis if we saw, uh, if we saw fit to do so. My, my own inclination, but I want to hear from the rest of the committee, is that uh, it might be appropriate to simply assign someone um, on a month-to-month -month basis a rotating member of the committee who would just go in with one signature um, and then the next month and we would assign that pr new person the, the last meeting of the prior month so that and it would be based on the convenience of the member obviously if the member was going to be away a significant portion that we would choose a different member but but basically it would be a, a rotating responsibility of the school committee to provide that one signature it is perfectly within the uh, regulations to do so in fact we could technically assign a non-member but I think that would be uh, remove us significantly from from the process but I'd like to hear from the rest of the committee uh, Mike what are your thoughts Um, it doesn't mean you can't say stick with the current process. Well, that, 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 that's what I was going to say. I mean, the current process has been around forever. Um, uh, uh, Are you uh, a traditionalist? No, <laughs> but I think it's. I think the three signatures um, provides a c accountability, and um, I'd, I'd prefer to see three signatures. Okay. Rhonda? I think that what I like about the. One, it, it's about the, uh, it's about getting the bills paid. It is about having a system in place that allows our administrator to get the bills in on time and paid on time so there isn't any lag. I am concerned about the three signatures and the uh, management of trying to, the communication and the management of trying to get uh, people, you know, to come in, especially when, you know, three of the members, you know, have full-time jobs and you know everyone is really busy uh, and so that that is a concern that I do feel that um, that we need to be able to get the bills in, in a timely manner and so I'm comfortable with the rotating one person um, because I think that it does uh, allow or make it easier for uh, the superintendent and for the administrators to get the job done but I would want to hear from the superintendent um, what his opinion is on this. Okay. okay, through the chair to the members. Um, I had a conversation on, I think it was Monday morning with our bookkeeper who actually pays the bills. And her concern with this process is that to get the three signatures upstairs, which is the accountant's office in the town, actually pays the warrant or um, on a Wednesday. So they have to be the assigned and available on a Wednesday morning. So that by allowing people to come in and then sign at any time, like on a Friday, it, it won't go until the following Wednesday so that what now takes um, one week to get paid now would at least go to two. And just so that everybody understands the full process, um, most of our purchases are done by purchase order, which means, let's say, Mr. Gilmore decides he needs 40 cases of paper. 
he has his secretary go into the accounting system online and the VEDA and actually make out a requisition of 40 cases of paper. It then comes up and Anna, um, actually Anna's secretary then make sure that it's appropriate and there's enough money in the account. It then gets moved to Anna's screen and as the business manager, director of finance, she's the one that okays that yes, that school needs that product and okays it and then allows it to be made a purchase order. Once a purchase order happens, that purchase order is mailed out to a company, the products come so in other words, we don't pay for things until we have them in-house. So the 40 cases of paper come. So now maybe we're into it for two or three weeks already. The paper is sitting in the basement of that school. Then Lynn has to, gets the sign thing that it, the product is there. That's when she then goes in to pay the bill or to make the warrants to pay the bill. So what we're doing is we're adding an additional week for vendors of waiting for the money. That was her major concern with this. Um, and as she said, um, one of us, if, if Anna is not in, then I have to go through them and sign it. If she's in, she does it. Um, and then having a school board member as well, we at least have that oversight. Um, in the eight years that I've been associated with it, we have never um, said that we're not going to pay a bill. Yes, there have been questions about what was this for or whatever, and we've explained it. Um, but so that's the process, and it, it's about efficiency and being able to move these things on. But I like the old way we used to do it, but in actuality, we were signing them after they, they were paid. Okay. Mr. Chair, another question? Yes. Uh, how, do you, how did the process go these last couple weeks when getting the bill signed and being able to get the three signatures? We took the accountant's um, thing to begin, beginning with FY13 that didn't start until this week, July 1st. So the last two weeks we've been going under the old, even though you were coming in and signing, they've already been paid. Okay. And it's the end of the year is when the most difficult time because you're trying to um, balance your accounts to get um, as close to zero as possible. Yeah. And then one of the questions I had is, how did the board selectmen do it today? I did, the, the town bills. Do the board selectmen also have to provide three signatures or? They. My understanding. I mean, they meet weekly, mm -hmm. and they come into the office by a particular day and sign bills weekly. That's my understanding of how. But do you know if it's one board. signature, three signatures? I, I don't okay. know if they've changed. It was always three signatures. Uh, my only experience is when a particular select person held one of our bills to be paid. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mike, any other questions? No. Okay, I'm going to postpone a decision on this because I don't sense a consensus among the three of us. And I think it's important to get the other two members involved in the decision. So that means the status quo will continue and we'll come into the office as necessary to make sure we get the signatures going. Well, that's what we'll and, <laughs> and Michelle, if, if you would put this on the agenda for the next meeting, okay. I would appreciate it. Um, the, I'm going to change the order and go to item number four, which is any other business. This is also because I'd like Ken to hopefully be here before we get to the vote on the superintendent's evaluation process. Um, and does anybody have any other business that they'd like to bring before the committee? Okay, I have one, um, and it's a result of a um, very relevant uh, email that Mike sent to me regarding the FY13 budget um, that M Michelle recently set out. Um, this year has been uh, a hopefully abnormally difficult budget process. Um, it has meant that technically we have approved a, an overall budget without seeing the line items associated with that budget. Um, we saw a lot of them, but there's a big difference um, between what we initially approved and what uh, we ultimately uh, approved, which is 
well, technically 270,000 if you include the 20,000 for non-net uh, below last year's budget. Um, it's also unusual because we actually have a vote on the override and the debt exclusions. The override specifically will impact the operating budget. Uh, so I'm going to suggest that even though technically we don't need to um, vote on it because we've approved a budget, um, that in the spirit of Mike's uh, comment that as much transparency as possible is a good thing, even though some people find that word obnoxious, I don't. Um, I think transparency is, is not a pejorative. I think it's a very positive thing. I'm going to suggest that uh, the first meeting after the 25th, uh, we get a, um, a major account breakdown, uh, which is, well, I say major, that's that three pager. Does that work for you? Yeah, yes. The okay. Three page and of course, three and of course, we'll have backup behind the three pager if there are questions. And at that point, we'll either be able to see what the impact of the additional seven hundred eighty thousand is, which we know is primarily uh, affecting t our classroom teachers, or we'll be able to see the impact of actually being two hundred fifty thousand below in the in the net school spending uh, line item. That means that we'd be looking at the meeting of uh, August 8th for that. If that meets with everybody's approval, I'll ask Michelle to put it on the agenda. Yep. No, I appreciate that, thank you. No problem, glad to do it, I appreciate the email. Um, okay, we are now ready to talk about the uh, superintendent's um, evaluation form and process that we have uh, changed in order to bring ourselves in compliance with the new state regulations for all educators in the state of Massachusetts starting with the superintendent and going down to the classroom teachers. Um, the last time we looked at it was almost two months ago, and people requested more time to, to look at it. Uh, so I wish there was more of us here, um, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get, uh, um, I really don't want this to be a two to one vote. <laughs> I'd like, to, like it to be three to nothing so we can have comfort level that even in the absence of uh, Cliff and Ken, uh, we would have at least a majority of the committee in support of these changes. So are there any questions on this, uh, these new forms and, and the process associated with it? Mr. Chair, I don't have any questions just because we were part of a workshop um, beforehand where we went through it. And it, right. it, it doesn't seem like there were any substantial, substantial changes to what we discussed at that, that meeting. And that's correct. Mr. Chair, if I can Please. just um, just to make it clear to the public, um, the, the reason we're going through this is that the state went through a process of changing the evaluation regulate the regulations um, pertinent to evaluation of all educational personnel, and so um, I think it's very fitting that the superintendent's evaluation. Um, become compliant with state regulations first since we have been working to get the teachers um, you know we've been working on I think you said three years to get it it's closing in on it, three years right? yes and we're getting very close hopefully for that process to be done and um, through unit B negotiations with the assistant principals we're also trying to get them to accept the state language so I'm very comfortable with accepting the state language um, and when we do this year's hopefully um, even though it will be we've agreed to do it under the old um, there'll be some trying to look at it through both lenses so there's a, a bit of a transition to the new uh, because I think the new is going to take us all some time to get comfortable with you know, we're comfortable with the old so the only thing I would add to that is from the key elements associated with these changes is there's a very really well-defined what we call rubric in the educational world uh, which literally says this is this is the standards by which you will judge someone and then how well did they do on those standards and, and those standards are described and proscribed with respect to uh, what they are. Um, that's, that's a very key element and then there's a there's believe it or not while we have been while we have been working 
um, with our superintendents for a while on goals. Not every district even had goals for their superintendent. Now there's a very clear, um, clear uh, message that goals are a part of the process and that some of the goals must specifically pertain to certain areas of, of performance. So it's a, I think it's a healthy process. I think the change is not going to be all that dramatic for, for Wareham, but for some districts of, across the Commonwealth it will be. Um, and it doesn't actually have anything to do with compensation. Um, that should be clearly understood by the, by the public. This really has to do with the process leading up to a compensation determination. Um, and that is also true for all the educators. It does not control compensation. Um, welcome, Ken. If my job is going to affect school committee, I've got to quit my job. <laughs> it's, it's good to hear your priorities in the right place. <laughs> Mike, any, anything else? Um, no, just uh, to reiterate from um, previously when we discussed this, I mean, the form is one thing, but the other component is, is the contract. This would end up as an amendment to the contract. An amendment to the contract. Beca and the reason is because the original form was a part of the contract. Right, right. Um, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I, I understand. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Ken, sorry to ask you so quickly after you're getting trying to get settled, but. Any, any concerns uh, before we vote on the uh, change to the superintendent's uh, evaluation process? No, I, I read it. I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. I'll take a motion to amend the superintendent's contract to reflect the new forms and process as uh, contained in your packet. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Four zero zero, thank you. Um, Ken, the only just very very quickly, the only thing you missed was um, we're going to wait to to get some imp uh, input from from you and Cliff on the payables issue. We're just going to continue continue the process the way it is now, which is to everybody go in as they can and sign off. Uh, there was some concern that expressed about a rotating one person and that sort of thing. So for the moment, it's status quo. And then on August 8th, uh, depending on the outcome of the election on uh, the special election on July 25th, the superintendent will give us a, a breakdown by major account of exactly what the impact on the budget will be. Uh, because as Mike pointed out in an email following Michelle's uh, sending us the budget, uh, it wasn't clear to him exactly what changes were, were going to take place, especially if the override failed to pass. And we are now ready. On the, Does that make sense? Yeah, on the, um, the signatures, uh, I was comfortable. I, I was actually going to make a motion today to, to have you sign and or your designee to, to get the process rolling. Well, that's, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Um, but Mike is, is, feels strongly that he wants multiple signatures. Is that a fair statement, Mike? That's pretty fair, yeah. OK. Yeah. I mean, don't don't let me hold up the process. I mean, if, if I just I just think that it's, it's more checks and balances, it's more accountability. It's it's worked till now. All right, let's we good to have a full vote on this. Yeah, one. I think we need a full vote. So schedule it for for the twenty fifth. Um, so we are now ready to begin the workshop. And just because this is a workshop, and I want yes. pe people to feel comfortable. Uh, and a little bit more casual than perhaps in a, in a regular meeting. Um, pause frequently for questions. Okay. If you think you're going to answer the, uh, the likely questions with the next slide, uh, don't bother to pause, just continue. <laughs> All right. And, and we'll catch up, but, but let's, there's a, this is really a contest to see how many acronyms you can learn in one evening. And, uh, and we'll have a prize for the person who can complete a sentence with the most acronyms in it. Um, but to be serious, it's an important presentation, and welcome, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sweat and the entire school committee. I appreciate the invitation through the superintendent, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I thought about having some kind of trash can here and just take all the acronyms and throw them in and, and strive not to use any of them. 
Uh, but uh, I'm sure that cannot be totally avoided. So I'm going to begin by telling you this is uh, a very compressed uh, presentation and a very uh, detailed presentation at the same time. So I've tried to summarize where I could. There's going to be a lot of details here, and I'm more than happy to go back and answer questions. Uh, if we look at it sheerly on time to end at the uh, proposed uh, 945, we have less than three minutes per slide and 10 minutes for Q&A. So given that, I will uh, do as you asked, Mr. Sweat, and slide through the slides, uh, no pun intended, that are fairly obvious and then pause where need be. I think it is fair to say that uh, we are aligning, as it says in the first slide, the Common Core State Standards, that's what CCSS stands for, the new curriculum, mass curriculum frameworks, which, are incorpor which incorporate the Common Core State Standards, the new NCLB waiver accountability system, and the Massachusetts Educators Evaluation System. The Commonwealth, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is calling this the Teaching and Learning System. So you are going to be introduced to the uh, full scope of the Wareham Teaching and Learning System. And this. So if we look at the whole picture and we think of it as a target, the target is student achievement. That is everyone's goal. To meet that target, we need the whole picture and that is the teaching and learning system, including the wraparound zone and beyond school time programs that you heard from Mr. Luzon at our last meeting. And you cannot exclude what happens in Wareham from the influence of our community, our Commonwealth, and the United States government. Because the Department of Education at the federal level is influencing all of the above. Basically, using the new definitions and the new vocabulary uh, that has been introduced over the last basically 13 months is the teaching and learning system is an integrated and coordinated district-wide system to support effective instruction and student achievement. What that means in common language is that everything needs to work together and to be well coordinated in a to build district capacity because through that framework then we can support a multiple tiered system of support for our students. We can have an intentional connection of professional development for teachers, the learning program, curriculum for students, and educators evaluation. That doesn't mean this hasn't happened in the past, but what it does mean is that there's more of a focus on the connections. So in every grant we write, in every review we go through, we have to show that connection. One of the things that our superintendent has, um, in a very friendly and supportive way, imposed on me that has really helped to clarify, I think, a lot of my work and a lot of my work with our teachers is to try to display it with as few words as possible in a graphic representation. So if we look at it graphically, this is our daily work, the teaching and learning system. It encompasses curricu Massachusetts curriculum frameworks, which incorporate the Common Core Standards, the Massachusetts Accountability System, moving from an AYP standard to PPI. PPI is Progress and Performance Index, and you'll be hearing more about that. And incorporating the new Massachusetts Educators Evaluation Program, which is both affects and effects all of the realms. As we go through this, we're going to go through this one component at a time. And to show you the relationship of the uh, intensity as well as the importance, the detail, the, just to give you an overview of the slide presentation, there are about 25 slides on the new Massachusetts curriculum frameworks and common core standards. There's 10 slides on the new accountability system and 10 slides on educators evaluation. So the focus is really on what happens in the classroom. And the state has said that this is not different from past initiatives so much as that it's an intentional coordination. Because what they have found through research, not just here in Massachusetts, but across in all the states and actually as far as a global education, is that unless you build capacity district-wide, 
no school is going to be truly effective. So it has to be a high achieving educational program for all students and teachers within a coordinated district approach. We're going to move right along to our curriculum. One of the things that the superintendent and I had to do for our review in January was create an organizational flowchart as to how curriculum authority in the district organizationally and procedurally occurs. And I thought to frame the new alignment, I would share this chart with you, although I'm sure most of you saw that in our review documents. Basically, it is a coordinated effort where the ideas, the concerns, and the vision generates from our superintendent as well as from our teachers and faculty. So it's a, it, it is a shared approach. We hear from and build from bottom up as well as top down because there are initiatives that you're going to hear about tonight that are imposed on us and there are needs that come forth from our teachers and faculty. Within our district, we have a strong organizational system through vertical curriculum teams, curriculum committees, an advisory team called the Instructional Leadership Team, which includes our instructional leaders and department chairs, as well as classroom teacher representatives. Through that organization, I work with them as both an advisory team and an informational team, and they also are the core of our train the trainer model. We meet with principals and other administrators in the district, usually bi-weekly. The cabinet or the superintendent and directors meet weekly, and all of this is coordinated together. Jan? Yes. I think that when I looked through this, that this was the one that confused me. I'm a big fan of organizational charts, not just to, not to be able to show who's, is, who's boss, but to that when there is a conflict or if there is a difference of opinion, that there is a decision-making authority that basically says this is it. And I know that ultimately is a superintendent. I get that. But you also need to be able to have that kind of, you know, management level to, to make some of those decisions right then and there instead of it going to committee and going up and then all of a sudden there's three or four meetings to discuss who's right about it. Right. This organizational chart confuses me when it comes to, um, really how are you going to be able to get these standards through um, when you know I, I see that there's a, a solid line to the instructional leadership team but that's made up of instructional leaders and department chairs correct correct and not all of them just does no all of them okay so all of them um, but there's a dotted line to there so all of a sudden if that team has an issue mm -hmm. with uh, what the superintendent and you have basically come down and said uh, this is the way that that this is how we're rolling this out and this is the way what what do you do in that situation does it have to come back up to the principals and the superintendent or is it at that committee meeting that this is the way that it's going to be rolled out and that Jan has the authority to be able to do that it stems from the conversation between Jan and I that the decision is made. And then when she meets with the instructional leadership team, it is before she meets with me to get input from people that are in the trenches in the schools. And after we have made the decision to then to give marching orders. So when we have um, the uh, new math curriculum alignment, which you'll see later in this document. And we made the decision that we needed to redo the math curriculum to have it aligned with the mass core. We then decided, okay, that's gonna happen. To implement it, we needed a team of people to actually redo the courses, and those would be the teachers that are actually teaching the actual courses. So you have an algebra teacher who's going to help rewrite the algebra curriculum with the state documents under the supervision of Jan, which is the implementation. Now, and I understand that in an, in an organizational chart like that, 
this doesn't really show that, okay. but that's the actuality. So perhaps when we get down to some of the um, changes that have been made in the curriculum, Jane can actually highlight how those have occurred. And through you, Mr. Chair, I, I get um, the collaboration. I think that you absolutely need to be able to get input from the teachers and faculty as well as instructional leaders. And but if the only thing that I would suggest is is you know as we're going through this presentation, and if all of a sudden an organizational chart um, comes out of that, and it makes sense that I would just ask that this is updated because if this is something that's going to be shown, um, you know, across the board, you know. It, it would be confusing on if one of the instructional leaders has an issue with, you know, what's going on. Who do they go to? All Ultimately, I'm saying is that, that this is, I, I get what you mean, and so, and that's great. I just wish what you said was reflected here. Well, ultimately, the instructional leaders report to the principals. So that and those kinds of conversations, if there is a difference of opinion, uh, will come to our administrative team. I'll bring it to Barry's attention. The ultimate final say on what needs to be implemented is, of course, the superintendents, and I carry it out. So, yes, there's collaboration. Uh, there's also a bottom line, and the bottom line is we have to be aligned with the new curriculum frameworks yeah. and Common Core. Okay, thank you. So we, we'll, but I hear what you're saying. So okay. we'll move ahead and come back to it. And I apologize here, this is a little more sensitive. Um, the curriculum adoption protocol that you see here shows a lot of detail. This is part of our policy manual that any curriculum adoption has to go through the process of teacher review. Our instructional leadership team is part of that protocol in that any curriculum committees, at least one and usually more than one member of the instructional leadership team serves on that committee as well as I serve on that committee. So that we do any curriculum adoption has to go through this review process. It has to be sure that a new curriculum, a new program, a new textbook is not only unbiased, but is aligned. And so there's a whole checks and balances process and protocol that we have to follow in order to adopt any new curriculum. And I lay this out as a framework. We'll probably come back to this. And is it collaborative? Yes. However, please remember, the final decision is not with that curriculum committee. Although we go through this protocol, because it, and it is policy and it is teacher buy-in, it comes back to me as a proposal. I share it with the superintendent. This is what the committee is proposing. I disagree or agree based on the standards and the alignment and the quality as well as price and then the superintendent makes the decision. The aligned curriculum is the new Massachusetts frameworks which include the Common Core State Standards. What happened in 2010 is that the National Common Core State Standards were released as a draft <coughs> and then adopted by 48 states plus the District of Columbia. Between June 2010 and December 2010, Massachusetts reviewed them and adopted the new Massachusetts frameworks. Those frameworks incorporate the Common Core State Standards and added 10 more. So that's why it says the new Massachusetts curriculum frameworks including Common Core State Standards. They were adopted uh, officially by the Board of Education in December 2010. They were not released until March 2011. So we've had just over a year to get to know them. I wanted to clarify something that has sometimes caused confusion. In 2009, the Mass Core was adopted for all high school course of studies. And I presented that to you. The Mass Core is a high school course of studies. It is not the Common Core. So we have two different things here. And I'll move on. Basically, this is ex the timeline that we must uh, adhere to from the Department uh, of Elementary and Secondary Education. This past year was a year of partial implementation, uh, with this coming year being nearly full implementation. Full implementation, including benchmark assessments, is 2013 to 2014. 
The nearly full implementation for 2012 and 2013 ideally will include curriculum instruction, all grades, subjects, and courses, and some benchmark assessments. But we are not required to have full implementation until 2013, 2014. We are hoping to be ahead of that. Jan, one second. So I think that you're about to answer it. I was going to okay, say, that's what, why is, what is partial implementation? Like, very, that's, very simply, okay. That's what, that's this Example. slide. All right, where are we as a district? In partial implementation, we opted this during 2010, 2011 to start the work in K-5. And that was a focus on math and literacy. Last year, K-5, literacy, ELA, and math were fully aligned with the new Massachusetts curriculum frameworks and common core standards. Some assessments have been put in place, some benchmark assessments, not to the level that we needed. However, we began and we implemented through the course of the year ELA literacy and math. We began also the science curriculum, and it sh this should really say K-8, I'm sorry, not K-5. K-8 was partial implementation. And I'm, so it's K-8, not K-5. That's a typo. I, I apologize. K-8 has had partial implementation and nearly full implementation in ELA, literacy, and math. Science is being added this next year. Grades 9 through 12 began at the very end of this year, and that was delayed by their work on NEASC and felt that they needed to get that done before they began any curriculum alignment. 912 is going to be really working in high gear, and they started in May uh, after some initial meetings where I brought them through and what was the Common Core, what is the new frameworks, and then began the work. So those vertical teams have already begun working with a goal of all grades and subject full implementation in 2013 to 2014. Yes. Are you as the chair? Yes. I definitely don't want to prolong this, but I just, I need an example of just pick a grade and math. What were we not doing mm -hmm. that we are now aligned? Okay, if you just bear with me through the next few slides, you'll see that. Thank you. Okay. I, I want to go th through a little, and, and if I don't come back to that, please remind me. I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what kind of shifts need to be done. So this is, what has changed is a real focus on college and career readiness from the earliest grades, even pre-K a greater emphasis on the inquiry approach with practice and modeling throughout the instructional process and the learning process. Increased text complexity. That means the reading levels of all texts have been increased one half to one full academic year. The focus on narrative text fiction has decreased. So one of the things that we were doing, especially in our elementary grades, is we had a high focus, as did most schools, on narrative fictional texts, on short stories. Under the new frameworks, we have to have a balanced approach between fiction and nonfiction or informational text, 50-50 at the K-5 level, 60-40 at the middle school 6-8 level, and 70-30 informational text at the high school 9-12 level. So Jan, how can we do that when we don't have money for books? That is the absolute question, elephant in the room before us, absolutely. We are using every grant penny that we can find um, in order to purchase supplementary texts or supplementary resources for our teachers so that they can do that. Do we have the textbooks to do this? No, we do not. So then how can we, the slide that you did before, how can we be partially um, done K through eight when we don't have the materials to be able to support it? Because we have, we, partial implementation does not mean full. 
We have purchased some additional uh, paperbacks. We've purchased some additional periodicals in order to, do, to start to bring this balanced approach to literacy of fiction informational text. And that's why it's only partial. We'll never get out of partial without additional materials and resources. So that's the only reason why I go back to, you know, saying that we're partial right now. I mean, partial could be partially 10%, partially 40%, partially, that, that's why, again, just more of the high level is, is uh, not frustrating but me, but, but more, that, that's the reason why digging down a little bit into detail so then we know exactly this is something that we have to do. Yes. And the thing is, is that I like this because it's telling us where we need to go, but that one jumped out saying that we're going to go from 70-30 in the high school when it comes to, uh, you know, fic fiction compared to um, informational. We haven't even begun the high school, quite honestly. I mean, we've begun looking at what we have to do in mapping curriculum. Have we listed the, what it's the uh, some of the resources we're going to need? Yes. But in I, the elementary, we need to be at 50-50. What were we this past year or the year before? I would say two years ago, we were probably 20% informational, 80% fiction. This past year, we were close to 40% informational. By using grant funds, we were able to buy what are called leveled readers, not for every student, but a class set so that teachers could share them and students could begin to read and learn to read informational text. For example, in one of, there was, to bring it right down to the classroom level of, let's say, a third grade classroom, they had a leveled reader. Uh, it was a small, thin paperback book. We purchased a class set that was shared across the grade level in each of the two elementary schools and one particular book was at the third grade reading level produced by National Geographic on firefighting and forest fires. So it encompassed some science, it encompassed the reality of forest fires, and it was still at that third, the new third grade reading level so that the students had both pictures and text, they had the text complexity, and they could read about forest fires, what happened to the ecosystems, what happened to the animals, the individuals who live there, and then also about the firefighters who fought it. Then they wrote about it and discussed it. So that's one example. Did every child have a copy of that book? No, we couldn't afford it. We used grant funds we were able to get through a literacy partnership grant to buy class sets and to share them. I don't know if that... No, it, it just frustrates even more, so it, it's fine. I mean, I, I think that the it's kind of like we're going to meet these standards, but with the bargain basement things that we can afford. So it's not even like that we're going to meet the mass core standards with exactly the text that they are recommending to us. We're going to go scrape, find grant money to be able to find a National Geographic magazine that is the cheapest that we can find so we can get as many kids as possible on that instead of basically providing our children with exactly what the what Massachusetts is requesting, which is probably, they're giving us example of the type of text that we should be including in our classroom. Thanks. Yes. One question. Rhonda used the term requesting. Is Massachusetts actually requesting this or are they demanding this? Oh no, this is regulation. This is demand, so this, this is, is not, not a request. request. This is not a request. No, sir. This is, this is regulation. And what you're going to see as we move into accountability is that even the assessment system is changing so that these demands or these regulations are not even just Massachusetts. This is national. There are 48 states in the District of Columbia all following this. And the national assessments will begin in 2014 based on the assumption that we've implemented this. Are you going to get to the impact on instruction as well? Yes. Thank you. Just as literacy ELA is increasing in complexity and in changing focus, mathematic expectations are also increasing. 
pre-algebra and the standards of mathematical practices have changed and have increased. Pre-algebra concepts are introduced in third and fourth grade so that all of the expectations have increased at the same time that mathematical practices for instruction have moved toward away from uh, simple computation, if you will, to application and modeling. And I'll get into some more details of that, but that is another big shift. And what application and modeling means is that our students from the youngest age on are being asked to explain how they did the math and how that works to solve a real world problem. At the same time that we have these increases in literacy and algebra, the regulations require increased integration across the curricula in all grades, including pre-K. Yes? Sorry. Uh, actually, I want to piggyback on uh, Rhonda's point earlier on the other bullet. Um, getting back to the firefighter books, for example, yes. let, let's 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 say you had adequate funding this past year. Um, I, do I do I infer correctly that you that wouldn't have been your choice of book, even though, it, in other words, you used that book, but it, it was partially done because it wasn't done for everybody. But 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 if you had adequate funding, is it the case that you would still use that book, but it would have been for everybody, or you would have been had like better books? The or both. One of the things, um, and it comes out in a later slide, but this is as good a time as any to share with you, uh, through the uh, vertical ELA literacy team of teachers and instructional leaders and myself, uh, we have reviewed what's out there. Uh, through my work with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, I was introduced to the National Geographic reading and literacy program called Reach for Reading. It is a comprehensive literacy program that integrates science and social studies. It is the only one that I have found that's research-based and aligned with the Common Core State Standards. It is so new that they're literally printing the upper elementary grades this summer. It is a phenomenal curriculum, um, both in its uh, support for teachers in bringing them into the new standards and in what it offers our students. The comprehensive, it's just totally comprehensive. It has an online component, it's interactive, as well as text. So that is our goal, is to be able to purchase this National Geographic reading and literacy program called Reach for Reading. We have already introduced in the district the component of it for English language learners. We have introduced it through our teachers in in workshops. We have priced what it would cost to purchase the full program for every student, pre -K, uh, kindergarten, first, and second grade, because that's where we have the least amount of resources. In third, fourth, and fifth, we've been adding resources a little bit piecemeal, but all in this comprehensive approach to literacy, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So. What we purchased in those leveled readers for the firefighters is one small component of the Neo National Geographic reading program. So it is where we're going. I wouldn't have proposed we use any funds for something that was subpar. So we haven't gone for bargain basement quality. We've gone for bargain basement numbers. If that, you that, that's, that clarifies exactly what I was looking for. You're very satisfied with what you're buying. You just need more of it. For example, to buy a classroom library with those leveled readers um, is a few thousand dollars. We're talking, you know, about five thousand dollars per grade level. If we just bought one classroom set, to buy an entire the entire program for one grade level, so all students would have access to the books, is in excess of seventy-five thousand dollars. The um the ballot question for the textbooks and technology, will that adequately fund what you're looking for? It will be, a, we will be able to buy that kind of a program for grades kindergarten, first and second. We would have to continue and look at what we needed as supplements to three, four and five, because they already have some resources. 
Uh, will it adequately fund what we need in K-1 and 2 as far as textbooks? In literacy, yes. The infrastructure for technology to truly use the interactive online component would start the process. But again, we have other technology issues that would have to be addressed as far as infrastructure. So do I infer correctly that even if this ballot question passes, that district-wide would still be behind the, the eight ball here? Technology is going to, is a long process and it's a big project to bring us really to the level that we need to be. Would we ha but there's alternatives. For example, if we are able to purchase this program, we have computer labs, we have <coughs> laptops on a cart so that students could have access, not all at the same time, but maybe by classroom to the interactive approach. Uh, right. Families who have computer and online access at home would be able to do it at home. We've discussed the possibility of even keeping our school computer labs open later so that students who didn't have it at home could come in. So we'd have to phase it in to have the full technological access. But as far as the, the textbooks that we need to prepare our youngest students in literacy, the uh, debt exclusion would give us the textbooks for grades K, 1, and 2 in literacy. Thank you. Uh, to come back to this bullet of integration, this means that to some extent everything that's old is new again. For some of us that began teaching in the 80s or before, we were used to integrated thematic units where students learned not only how to read and write, but how to demonstrate what they had learned through reading and writing, through presentations, through projects and through a very integrated approach where their reading and writing, speaking and listening were demonstrated through projects, through products that were then presented. Not just research projects, but, perhaps, but a building project or a performance project. Well, it's come full circle to realize that students learn through those kinds of projects, through those kinds of applications of learning. So the new standards include literacy in all content areas. It's not enough to go really back into time to be able to read, you know, C. Dick and Jane. It, what you have to be able to read is the science article, the social studies article, so that every teacher is a reading teacher, every teacher is a writing teacher. So this is where a lot of our professional development has to focus. The other integration is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And this is part of the global education, is to increase students' ability in all four of those content areas in a very integrated, applied manner. So these are the big shifts. What are the consequences? New curriculum maps for our teachers to follow, new textbooks, <coughs> new programs that incorporate the technology and the online access. And all of it has to be supported with professional development and training for our teachers and administrators, as well as additional supports and monitoring for teachers and students to meet these expectations and higher standards. So those are the consequences of the shifts. It just Yep, you want me to go back? No, well, you can if you want. When are the teachers actually getting the new material that they're expected to teach? What we have done is because the goal is to purchase this Reach for Reading program in K-1 and 2, uh, Anna and I worked together to put together grant funds that we had at the end of this year and we purchase the teacher's materials for K-1 and 2 with a classroom set with those grant funds in May and June. And I met with the teachers the week after school ended, brought in the consultants from the Reach for Reading National Geographic program, and those teachers were given an introduction to it, and they were all given their teacher's materials. So they received them the week of June 
20th, tw between the 20th and the 22nd, they receive them. With the expectation that by September, they would have incorporated all of that into their lesson plan. Yes, because at the same time that we've given them these materials, we have our literacy, scope and sequence curriculum committee who have worked to develop the curriculum maps, which outlines the lessons, which outlines the scope and sequence to meet the literacy standards for K through 8. Those literacy maps are available on Rubicon Atlas, and they have also been introduced to the teachers. So they have a pacing guide. They have a map of where, what they need to develop in their, in their daily and weekly lessons. So you expect that to go smoothly in the fall? I am anticipating that we will have the override, we will have enough textbooks for every student, and the implementation will go smoothly. And absent the override, what are the consequences? The consequences are is that we will proceed because we are required to be aligned with the new standards with the minimum amount of materials with a class set that is shared across the grade level. That phrase, class set shared across grade level, I, I'm not even going to ask you what that means. Go ahead. Copy. Go ahead. Okay. This, I'm just going to breeze over, but I'll answer any questions. These are the key ideas of the new standards and frameworks, or the new, as the state calls them, the new curriculum frameworks. Uh, but it's important, I think, to emphasize this right from the beginning, this first bullet, that college and career readiness begins at birth. There's a real focus on the fact that families need to be part of the learning process. And I think we have to do more to bring this to our, our families of our students. That the idea of bringing this coherence between standards for literacy, for informational text, for writing, also has to begin in the home. There has to be these kinds of conversations about learning, reading, writing, <coughs> and the emphasis on evidence and using it precisely. This whole linkage, of course, reading and writing, is with the goal that a literate student is going to be a successful adult. So it's a big idea. It's a strong emphasis. I don't think it's terribly new, but the focus on it needs to be reemphasized. Uh, and again, this is. This is right, as you can see, right off the department's website that being literate is at the heart of learning in every subject area. And this habit of inquiry, multimedia, global context, these are all the principles of learning that undergird the new standards and frameworks. Rhonda, you would ask for some detail. These are the kind of maps that our teachers are receiving so that they have the detail that shows them the complexity of text by grade level, the writing, and then leading to, in this case, a research project. So this is what our teachers are receiving. And this is just an overview. It's one viewpoint or one view. There are multiple views. And what grade is this for? This is elementary, so you, you actually have uh, the different grade levels presented there. So you have Greek myths in grades three through five, science one, two, social studies one, okay. two. So it, it, it's bridging over grade levels, showing the integration of that one reading standard. That RL410 is one reading standard that is actually taught in fourth grade, but it encompasses the grades before it and the grade after it. We're going to switch from literacy to math. Again, in, in, literacy, you, in literacy ELA, you saw the focus on a literate student. In mathematics, the word they use is, in mathematics is expertise for all students at all grade levels. 
the idea that students can, can reason both abstractly and quantitatively begins early on through models in mathematics, through constructing arguments, being able to, even if they can't quite add or multiply or divide yet, they can talk about a model and they can look at representations in order to do the abstract thinking quantitatively. The other focus is on precision and accuracy. And this is all part of this idea of reasoning undergirding learning. The students are able to explain the process they're using to get the solution they have found. The specificity in the mathematics curriculum has increased in the sense that if you see the former framework there in mathematics, again, this is a grade four sample. They were asked to identify and generate equivalent forms of common decimals and fractions less than one whole. That's the old frameworks. How has it changed in the new? Explain why a fraction AB is equivalent to fraction NXA divided by NXB by using visual fraction models with attention to how the number and size of the parts differ even though the two fractions themselves are the same size. So students, for example, are asked to explain how two-fourths and one-half are both different and the same by using models. And that's the specificity that teachers need to use in their instruction. So this is one of the big shifts in that students are able to not just recognize and generate equivalent fractions, but to explain how they've done that. Uh, the foundation for algebra begins, as I said, in early grades, no later than grade three, with values and operations. And uh, one of the new programs that has been introduced, Everyday Math, and I'm going to talk about how we came about introducing that, uh, did just that. For example, in 2010, when the Common Core State Standards were first introduced through a draft, we looked at what was going to be required of our students. The we I'm referring to is myself and brought it to the superintendent after workshops I went to. Then brought it to our instructional leadership team and said this is where we have to go. We looked at what the standards were. We looked at the data from our MCAS results as well as local assessments, but mostly MCAS, and said our student achievement and the common core standards are definitely not aligned. We need to raise the expectations of our students in order to meet what's coming out in new standards. This, we did not have the Massachusetts new curriculum frameworks yet. What we had was the common core state standards that Massachusetts said they were going to adopt. So we began in 2010. Through that analysis, and again, using our instructional leadership team, using teachers, their colleagues, so they could see what the problem was, then we began looking at what was out there. We not only looked at what programs were available to increase students' expectations, but we looked at what programs were successful in other districts. We compared districts of like demographics, and we looked at districts with different demographics. The program that rose to the top, if you will, was out of the University of Chicago, and it's called Everyday Math. It is a program that has been around for more than 10 years and has a strong research base as well as a strong history of success. The teachers viewed it. There was lots of concern about it because of the demands upon students. It was adopted and it has been implemented. K-5 has used the Everyday Math program. This past year was their second year. So they've gone through two years of implementation. It is aligned with the Common Core. We had to make some tweaks when Massachusetts added their own standards. Uh, but it has been implemented. And you saw in just the first year, although it's not a trend, but just in the first year, you saw our elementary mathematic achievement go up in, Mass in MCAS scores. We anticipate that's going to continue. It wasn't enough to stop at grade five. We said, all right, we're increasing this. Now we need to look at middle school. 
We have to prepare the students with the foundation they need in this strong foundation of mathematics in the elementary grades, but we have to bring it into the middle grades. So a year ago, we began analyzing what was needed in the middle grades and comparing that to what was out there and what was available. Once again, we went to the University of Chicago mathematics system because one, they have the strongest research base, and two, they have the strongest record of success. And so we adopted the grade six everyday math program to have a clear and a better transition from elementary. And we adopted what is called transitions math for grade seven, which is an integrated pre-algebra program. It's not just pre-algebra, it's pre-geometry. It includes statistics and probability. It is the foundation of all future mathematical instruction. And we implemented the grade eight algebra, which is again is an integrated algebra approach at two levels. So there's also an accelerated grade eight math. That was implemented this past school year uh, with a lot of support and a lot of training, both from the company and from our local uh, support system in the DSAC, the District School Assistant Center. And their mathematics specialist, Madeline Roy, has done a lot of work with our teachers. So this new program through grant funding has been adopted now K through eight. What is that impact going to be on grade nine? They are going to receive students in ninth grade with a stronger foundation in mathematics, with a better preparation for all high school math programs than they have in the past. Because we have raised not only the standards and the rigor, but we've also increased the practice and the modeling so that our students in K through eight are doing the kinds of mathematics that is required of them to be successful as they continue through high school, college, and career. No questions? Okay. Um, the high school organization, this is where we've begun our work uh, this spring with our vertical math team. They have gone to, some of our teachers have gone to workshops. We've brought workshops into the district so they can begin to learn how these conceptual categories are in all of the mathematics courses, grades 9 through 12. This is a very large shift for our teachers in the high school. Uh, in fact, I just met with our mathematics department chair yesterday as we talked about what teachers would be working on the new curriculum alignment this summer. We do not have the textbooks for this yet. That's part of the debt exclusion, is to get these mathematics textbooks. Why do we need new textbooks in mathematics? Because Algebra 1 in ninth grade is not what it used to be. Algebra 1 in ninth grade is now the second half of what used to be Algebra 1 and the first half of Algebra 2. The level of detail that our students must learn both in the conceptual categories and in the emphasis on college ready has increased. So that in order to take such courses as calculus, discrete math, or advanced statistics, they need this bottom level of foundations beginning in Algebra 1. Then geometry has also increased in that it is requiring, I think I, it's requiring modeling. This idea of taking a, not just a geometric proof, but taking that real world question, being able to solve the problem, <coughs> through a geometric proof and a model. So the geometry's intensity has increased, also including these conceptual categories. Algebra 2 under the new frameworks and common core standards, and again, these are state and national requirements. Algebra now, 2 is now the second half of what was Algebra 2 and trigonometry. So that if a student successfully completes Algebra 2, they are ready for calculus. They do not need to take pre-calculus. It is already incorporated through their Algebra 1 geometry and Algebra 2 courses. Uh, 
Right. Okay. Um, now, obviously, that's going to require a new textbooks as well, right? Yes. I mean, th and is that covered with the debt exclusion? What we proposed in the debt exclusion is if you go back, and I'm not going to go back through all the slides, but if you go back to that graphic that um, complete implementation, in other words, this next school year, FY13, is nearly full implementation. And full implementation with all of the benchmarks and assessments is FY14. So what the high school faculty has proposed is that with the debt exclusion, we purchase textbooks for grade nine. And then with grants or whatever funds are available for FY14, we would have to purchase textbooks for geometry and algebra two. So it is phased in. And the reason we kept more conservative with the proposal is that it is not until FY14 or May of 2014 that the students in high school will be assessed on the new standards. So the idea was we have to prepare the ninth graders because their mathematics assessment is in their sophomore year, which will be May 2014. And so then we can, they're going to, so that's why that phased in approach is looking at the assessment schedule as well as trying to be conservative in the amount of funding that would be available. Thank you. I'm going to back up just one here. Um, we've already talked about the idea of mathematics and the change in the courses. Please remember that. The goal is both career and college, so that students are able to handle the mathematics that they need going into a career or going into college. Jan, I have parents that come to me and, and say the following. I didn't learn math when I was in high school in Wareham, and my children aren't learning math, and they're in high school now. Can I tell them with confidence that this is going to solve that problem? You can tell them with confidence that we are working to solve that problem. I have been meeting with the vertical math team on just this problem. Um, the middle school math faculty have embraced the demands and the increased expectations and have attended, some of them attended pre-AP workshops that are this increased rigor. They, ha they have truly embraced the new standards. The high school faculty have been slower in their um, enthusiastic embrace of the new standards. The, part of the delay was the focus on NIESC, and I don't want to keep coming back to it, but I have to share with you that for two and a half years, there was virtually no other professional development done at the high school other than committee work to prepare for NIAS. And that was by virtue of the administration and getting ready for that. So when we began in December by my meeting with the faculty and introducing them again to the Common Core Standards and this focus, of course they're overwhelmed. This is a huge increase in instruction. And so they, they are aware of what needs to be done. We have a vertical math team. We have a sub-team of that focusing specifically on ninth through 12th grade. And one of the things you're going to see as I continue through the presentation tonight is that there's an interrelationship between what the demands are in curriculum and instruction, teaching and learning, and the new educator evaluation system. Because in order to obtain a proficiency rating in, instruct, in teaching and learning, in instruction, curriculum alignment, and student learning, there has to be proficiency demonstrated in the classroom. So those two are going to go hand in hand. And so I think you can assure parents that we are aware of the needs. We have a program. We know where we need to go programmatically. We have a monitoring system and we have a solution design. The implementation is going to take an all hands on desk, deck approach of administrators, 
district support and teachers in the classroom. And there's going to have to be probably some hard conversations about, no, this isn't the way you taught math before, but this is the way you have to teach math now. And that means that for some of our students, and I don't want to get too much into the educational ease, but we call it scaffolding. And so that means that for some of our students that have not had all of the foundational understandings that they need for these new mathematic standards, the teacher has the standard here, and then he or she needs to go assess where the student's learning is and work backwards and forwards, if you will, at the same time. Scaffold down what they're teaching and increase the intensity to bring the students up to the new expectations. So that's part of the training that we have to provide for teachers in the next school year. I'm sure that's a whole lot easier to say than do. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair. Yes. The need for administrators in general to try their best to stop using the word enthusiasm when it comes to our teachers and educators and administrators um, that, that we care about that when it comes to something that is not only mandated by the state but is also a directive from the, the superintendent and from the end. So I, I it, it just makes my skin crawl a little bit when we are worried about the enthusiasm of our educators getting excited about something because at the end of the day um, there's a lot of things that happen where you don't have to be enthusiastic about it but it um, from the business community it affects the bottom line and that's exactly what needs to get done and I think that if I worried about the enthusiasm of my staff when it comes to the goals that have been set out for me then I would um, I, I wouldn't be focused as much on basically at the end of the day I want to know who to blame if this doesn't get done and <laughs> enthusiasm and coming back and saying well we we didn't quite make it because we had to work on people's enthusiasm or we needed to yeah. work on um, our, our administrators really getting behind it I hear that a lot too getting behind it and there's a directive we have a goal of where we need to be and I know that resources and money and that's all part of it I get that but I am I know that we know where we are and that's great that we know what the problem is but it's still about I do want to hear it definitively we know what, where we need to be and this is the date that we're going to get there by and I know that I keep doing that sorry I agree with you wholeheartedly um, and I I have, to, I have to share quite candidly. You know, I bring to this position my own experiences, and that includes teaching and being an uh, instructional leader in four states and in districts far worse demographically, far worse off economically than Wareham, and have seen those changes. However, there are challenges that we face. Am I worried about enthusiasm in terms of their feelings? No. Am I worried about teachers' enthusiasm in terms of their commitment to instructing students with the kind of tenacity and perseverance that that instruction requires? Yes. Because I think that a teacher, and I'm expanding I'm not using enthusiasm as an emotion. I'm using enthusiasm as a commitment to Me that. The same. A teacher must not only be able to technically teach a subject, but be able to artfully deconstruct whatever that standard, whatever that expectation is that that student must learn to the smallest possible components that that student needs to learn and put it back together to meet the standard. And just looking forward to a, a very uh, important evaluation and follow-up and supervision Absolutely. for this. Absolutely. Because 
you can't just leave this up to, we have a great framework, we have a directive, and so we'll just see what, what comes out of it. It, it. it requires every piece. Every one of those components that we started with, you're going to see are interrelated. And you're absolutely right, Rhonda. It requires monitoring and it requires continuous attention and evaluation of what's being done, how it's being done, and what more needs to be done. Let me, let me take the flip side of that, believe it or not. <laughs> there's, there's at least two reasons why one might be unenthusiastic, okay? One is, it's more work, and I'm lazy, and I've had it, you know, and this is not for me. Okay, obviously that's an unacceptable response. But you could be unenthusiastic if you have this feeling of, been there, done that, and it isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like having, trying to get, for a second lieutenant to try and get a team of, of um, grunts to take a hill. You know, if you really believe the top of that hill is going to be really important to freedom, okay, then you do it with some enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. If you think taking that hill is irrelevant and the tactics associated with trying to take that hill are terrible, I don't think I can blame the, the soldier for saying, I don't really have much enthusiasm for trying to take that hill. Mm -hmm. So I... I'm listening and I'm trying to imagine. I already heard you say once, you know, I feel like, you know, it's, we've been there, done that in a sense. I forget the exact phrase you used, but it's almost like 10 years ago, this was a, a new thing and now it's new again. Yes. If I was a teacher, that would make me unenthusiastic because why have we stopped doing something that was working 10 years ago if it was so great? Why didn't we continue to do it? Or maybe it really didn't work 10 years ago, but now it's the next best thing, and someone's you know, resuscitated it as, as a new idea. So I think we have to generate, and I understand your point. You know, when you have to get something done, you have to get something done, and the expectation is you're gonna follow the leader. But you only follow the leader if you're convinced and you trust that it really is going to work. And this is why I think, although I wasn't here 10 years ago, I've only been here eight, but this is why I think we have that level of embracing moving ahead with vigor, rigor and enthusiasm at the middle school. Our middle school teachers, and what I referred to was the integration, the integrated approach to applying literacy and mathematics across the curriculum, whether in the STEM subjects or literacy across science and social studies. In the middle school, it was done in the 80s into the early 90s, and teachers saw it work. Why was it set aside? The prevailing belief is that it was set aside with the introduction of MCAS and the focus on coverage. The idea that you had to cover all these standards and everything was put into silos. And the integration across curricula was set aside because teachers felt the need to cover this wide expanse of standards and this breadth of material regardless of how deep you went. What has, has become obvious to most educational leaders is coverage isn't the answer. Learning is what needs to take but place. guess what? Somebody thought it was the answer in the past. Yes. So we have a credibility gap. There, there is, but I think Peop, but what I'm getting at here with our middle school that makes it a little bit different is that they saw integration work. So they're willing to do it again because they know it worked before. Okay, continue, please. Okay. As we move forward, quickly, how have we prepared for the new frameworks in the past year? There have been professional development sessions on K-5 informational text using reading specialists from uh, the department and our local DSAC. We have also had grade level teams and content area teams at the elementary and middle school looking at inf lessons in informational text, reading and writing standards, and integrating those standards. They have worked with common prompts, specifically 
uh, at the middle school with three to four common prompts and common scoring. Uh, we have had different session on differentiation for 912 to begin this idea of scaffolding. There have been sessions for all grades on the new curriculum frameworks incorporating the Common Core Standards. And we have introduced to all teachers the Atlas, Rubicon Atlas mapping online tool. All of the curriculum maps will be available online. Um, rather than take time tonight to go there, you are welcome to go through our curriculum website. There is a link to, curriculum, to Rubicon Atlas so that teachers 24-7, regardless of where they are, will be able to access these curriculum maps. And those are being built right now in literacy. They're already posted. Math is being built to be posted in the fall, and science is being worked on. So all of this has already begun. In curriculum development, we have vertical teams in literacy, mathematics, and science STEM. A vertical team is made up of teachers from representing elementary, middle, and high. A vertical team is usually 10 to 12 teachers with equal representation across the district and including special education. We have a K-8 literacy scope and sequence committee who has worked diligently on developing the scope and sequence map for literacy, English language arts, curriculum reading and writing. We are continuing to develop the literacy maps in Rubicon Atlas and they are available to our teachers. The mathematics vertical team has established the mathematic <coughs> pathways and the way to move forward in mathematics. STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math is a vertical team that has begun planning. To give you an example of how fast these things are coming at us is that the next generation science standards were introduced on May 20th. They are going to be adopted this fall and we're expected to implement them before the end, by the end of the year. So science, that team is working. In fact, they're working tomorrow. What does this uh, really mean in bottom line daily details? It means that the instructional leadership team meets at least monthly, more often for planning meetings when there's in-service or early release day planning to be done. The, I meet at least monthly with the instructional leaders in addition to their weekly meetings with their building administrators. And that is to keep this coordination and monitoring on the same page, if you will. There are monthly meetings of the vertical teams in literacy, math, and science. And then there are also work days beyond the school day and over the summer. There are weekly or bi-weekly curriculum mapping meetings. These all occur beyond the school day. Within the school day, we have had building-based meetings with grade level and subject teams have had consultations with administrators such as building principals as to what needs to be done to support the work of curriculum development and moving to the new standards. As I said earlier, we have had training in curriculum mapping software through our in-service and early release days. We have begun training in the assessment and use of formative data for instruction. That training has been for the instructional leaders and members of the instructional leadership team. They will then be the trainers to work with their colleagues in the fall and through the next school year. What does all this break down to? During FY12, these are the teams and the committees that have met, the hours they have worked beyond the school day and year, and in paying for those hours in stipends beyond the school day, what we have been able to support through some LEA money and a lot of grant money. And then any work in consultation for monitoring during the school day was done with substitute coverage. And that cost is not there. So this curriculum development, the implementations of these new standards is not without expense. And the expense goes beyond textbooks because it has to include the training of the teachers in what to do with it. Would you call it an unfunded mandate? I would absolutely call it an unfunded mandate, yes. I mean, I do want to say that one of the biggest sources of funding 
for all of these vertical teams has been race to the top. The vertical teams have been probably 60 to 70 percent paid for by race to the top grant funds. The literacy partnership grant that we have had for two years, and I just received notice today that we are eligible to apply for a third year, has helped to pay for the development of the literacy curriculum. So we've used a lot of grant funds. I'll just move right into professional development. Okay. Uh, professional development for FY12. We had sessions planned for in-service and early release days. These sessions were planned with both our administrators and our instructional leadership team. Again, in that collaborative approach. I'm sorry, as Jen. You have planned as in for the future. No. Planned as in the past. Sessions were planned for FY12 in okay. service so and early these release. Have already occurred. These have already occurred. Okay. There was specific training based on teacher requests, uh, and there has been training provided by the department and by DSACT. Then we are required to, and obviously for good planning, do a survey of all of the training sessions as well as a survey of teachers requests for FY13. This was accomplished uh, during the month of May through a tool called SurveyMonkey. And these are the results of the survey. I'm not going to go through every session, but as you can see, every single training session that was offered was listed in this survey. Teachers were asked to check if it was informative, applicable, and or if they would use it in class. The green, I want to make sure the colors come out the same on the screen. The green indicates the percentage of teachers who felt it was informative, applicable, and or they would use it in class. The purple represents the percentage of teachers who said, this, I really need more training in this. So, for example, the new math programs at the middle school, the third bar over, <coughs> teachers said, absolutely, it was informative, it was applicable, and some said, we'll use it in class, but I need a lot more training. So there was the purple. And you can see the various degrees in these graphs for each of those sessions. Um, there's been a lot of talk about critical thinking and the need for problem solving and for our students to learn how to apply that. That training was received in the green as informative, applicable, or to be used. More training. And then we had a percentage not useful. But by and large, as we go through, there's three slides because these are all the training sessions that were offered in FY12. This is the reception that is had from teachers. This is their response to that training. <coughs> is this all grades? Yes, this is all grades. Some were focused on specific grades. Some were across grade levels. For example, in the slide that's currently up on the screen, uh, in the fourth bar from the, the end, if you go over universal design for learning, this is a differentiated, inclusive approach to instruction that is part of the new standards. Because the new standards, and we've talked a lot about content, but they also focus on pedagogy and on the style of instruction. And one of the things that's demanded of our teachers is that they present their lessons in multiple modes so that students' different learning styles are addressed. Our teachers have requested training in this approach, which is called the Universal Design for Learning. That training that has been provided, in fact, by one of our own teachers, who is also an adjunct faculty member at Simmons, has been very well received and teachers have asked for more training. So we are going to be repeating that training, which is four sessions, uh, the week before school begins, again in the fall and again in the winter, based on demand. To just summarize the professional development survey, how is all this training with all this new stuff coming at them, which could be very overwhelming, how has it been received? I think you can see in those graphs, it was overwhelmingly positively received with one notable exception, and that was directly related to the presenter's skill and style. How was the participation rate on this survey? 91% of our teachers responded to the survey, or 221 of the 242 teachers. And there's the breakdown of respondents. 
I think the other significant thing that came through this survey, one of the early questions was, do you use the new curriculum frameworks and common core standards in planning your lessons? 75% of our teachers reported that they frequently refer to the new standards. So they're being incorporated. Now, this did not measure the extent of the incorporation, but we asked if teachers were aware of them and if they were using them. And 75% of our faculty said they are. So I think that's a building point in moving forward. I found it difficult to understand the x-axis, axes. I don't know what, for example, what developing S means. I'm sorry, developing? S. Where are you seeing developing? Third slide, the lowest. This, Maybe. This right here? I guess my, it's my problem with my computer. Okay, it says developing <laughs> SMART goals. Thank you, because all I got was S. All right, um, we have, this goes into the new educators evaluation program. We had to provide training in developing SMART goals. Okay. Uh, in the very first slide, the lowest uh, level of satisfaction was, perhaps not surprisingly, differentiation. Yes. It, is that the one you attribute to the uh, presenter? Yes. Enough said. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there are the requests that were noted. Um, we went. I. I obviously didn't list every single re request. I kind of used 12% of the respondents as a base, and those are the requests that were noted. It was an open-ended question, uh, as well as some specific questions, and then teachers could list anything they wanted that they felt should be incorporated in the training for the next FY13 school year. And those are the requests that have come from our teachers. This ends the section on alignment of the curriculum and professional development. I can pause here for any questions or move right into the new accountability system. Yeah. Okay. Would you say it's the expectation of DESE that the proper implementation of this curriculum along with the professional development for the instructors will produce excellent results regardless of the town in which it's done? That's their belief. Really? Yes. Fascinating. So when it doesn't happen, will they all resign? <laughs> Go ahead. It wasn't. It was a rhetorical question. I'll leave it as a rhetorical it, question it and was not a rhetorical go any further. Question. Go, continue. All right. Along with all these changes in curriculum, instruction, rigor, expectations for student learning, a new accountability system is implemented as of June 1st. So it's already here and with us. The criteria, the calculations have all changed because the state of Ma the Commonwealth of Massachusetts received a waiver to NCLB standards. And in their waiver, they created a new accountability system. The new system is called the Progress and Performance Index. And this is where I will stop using acronyms because they will not go smoothly over the tongue. But very simply, we've gone from AYP to PPI. So adequate yearly progress is gone, and we now have progress and performance index. I'm very, very excited. AYP, oh, that was so difficult. No, to Are you remember enthused? and to say, and now PPI. Are you enthused? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I have my own. I just want to know how long it took them to go to say, don't worry, we put, <laughs> see, I can't even say it. AYP, now it's PPI. It just reminds me of my, early in my career where I spent a whole entire day defining the word community. And then I asked a year later that company that made me sit in that meeting, 
defining the word community to give me my day back. <laughs> and I just feel that this is just something similar. So. Here we are. Deal. Um, I'm going to keep this, I, this is true, we've been through two thirds of the presentation. So this is just 10 slides, I'm gonna try to explain it very briefly, but give you enough detail so that when those reports come out, you've got it. Go through all 10, we will not stop you for questions. Okay. The progress and performance index, which I'm just gonna call performance index for ease of pronunciation, will be reported annually and cumulatively with two sets of ratings. It begins with the districts, not the schools. What the both, remember if you remember that target, that we've got the federal government imposing on the Commonwealth, which then imposes on us. What has been discovered through the lack of progress of all schools to meet adequate yearly progress is that you have to build district capacity to support schools which one could say then you need to have community support to support the district to support the schools, but we'll leave that hanging out there. The performance index incorporates both CPI and SGP. That means the composite performance index, which are the achievement scores and those performance levels of advanced, proficient, needs improvement warning, are still there, as well as the student growth percentile, and they're brought together in this calculation through a formula designed by the Commonwealth and approved by the federal government. The new system <coughs> calculates student growth and performance based on multiple years of data that accrue points. A perfect elementary or middle school would gain 500 points. A perfect high school and district can earn 700 points. And this chart is our preliminary provisional 2011 PPI. So in other words, after the fact, we have a new accountability system with old data. So they take the results of 2009, 2010, and 2011, and said in a weighted average with 2011 counting the most, they came up with new performance index targets and new groupings, and then evaluated the schools and the district. Just as in the old system, the district receives the level of its lowest school, it is true in the new system. The middle school is still rated both on student growth and for the aggregate and for the subgroups as level three. DECUS, again, is rated at a level two district, both in the aggregate and in the subgroups. Under this new formula, Minot Forest has dropped to a level two because of subgroups, and the high school has dropped to a level two because it has not shown student growth percentile in both the aggregate or subgroups. So under the new system, we have three level two schools and one level three school. How did this come about? Well, they did two things. The aggregate is still all students. But they said all these subgroups based on special needs, low income, uh, and various ethnicities are just too much because there's duplicated counts of students, which you've all heard about, that if a student is low income plus special needs plus of a certain ethnicity, they're counted three times. Well, they said that's not fair. So they created one subgroup called high needs students and it's an unduplicated count of all students. And that is what the subgroup is, it's one. And the formula is listed there to accrue the points of either five or 700, they take ELA achievement, mathematics achievement, and science achievement. So even though we didn't know that science was gonna count in 2009, 2010, and 2011, it counts for our new performance index. Then they say, okay, that's achievement. Then we're gonna look at growth, the median growth percentile in ELA and in math, that's 100 points each. Then for high school and district, 
we're going to look at the cohort graduation rate, both four and five year graduation rate for another 100 points, and the annual dropout rate for 100 points. And that's where the total of 700 points comes from. How do they get the index? Well, in order to earn progress and performance points, you get 100 points, the full 100 points, if you're above the target that has been assigned by the state, Department of Ed. You get 75 if you're on target, 50 if you've improved but you're below target, and zero if you declined. And you can earn extra points. If you have reduced the percentage of students scoring, warning, or failing, you get 50 points extra. If you increase the percentage of students scoring advanced, you get another 50 extra points. This is calculated by taking the number of points you've earned divided by the number of possible indicators. So for a district, if they had only 500 points they earned, but there are seven indicators, because remember, graduation and dropout rates are part of the indicators, they'd get 71 PPI. If they decreased the percentage of students in warning, the district would earn an extra 50 points, so suddenly the PPI is 550 divided by 7, or 78.5 for the performance index. It is cumulative. So in this cumulative average, it's progressive for more recent years. 10% for 2009, 20% for 2011, 30 percent I mean, 20% for 2010, 30% for 2011, and 40% for 2012. It is this cumulative performance index that is used to classify schools and districts. How do they come up with the targets? They call it gap halving. And included in your packet tonight was the full leadership guide to this system. So that if you have insomnia or if you want to learn more details, it's all in that packet. I actually read it. <laughs> it, it it's, it's a straightforward formula in many ways. The gap having for composite performance index is they take the distance between what was the composite performance index in 2011, subtract it from 100, which would be 100% proficiency, and have the distance. That is the target that has to be reached. And that's not going to change. Under the old AYP system, our target changed every year. This target will not change. So we have to reduce the gap by 50% over the next four years. In the student growth percentile, the median SGP for the state is the goal. And the target then is to improve the SGP to be between 51 and 59 percentile. So they want us to improve the SGP 10 to 14 points or decrease the number of students below proficient by 10 percent. And the gap having goals for graduation rates are this is by taking the goal is 90 percent, and they want continuous progress towards 90 percent graduation rate for four-year cohort, 95 percent for five-year cohort. And then gap having for dropout rate between what we had in 2011 to zero percent by 2016-2017. As a level three district, what does that mean for us? It means the criteria of level three is listed there, and we as a district are level three because our lowest performing school, the middle school, is at level three. That means we're part of the 20 percent, the middle school is part of the 20 percent of schools who are the lowest achieving in the state for both the aggregate, all students, or for the subgroups. What do we have to do because we're level three? These are district requirements, and they then are become school requirements. The district self-assessment 
of our implementation of standards and indicators must be completed using the conditions for school effectiveness. This is a rubric that the state has approved. We introduced it to our teachers and administrators last year. This year we've already discussed how it will be completed across the district. We have to notify parents and guardians of our level classification. We have to use the local DSAC grants and supports for interventions. 20% of Title I funds have to be reserved for to support those interventions. And special education will undergo annual review because of the percentage of students who are not meeting proficiency who are special ed. Can you tell this committee what the impact of that 20% reserve of Title I will be? It will not be a huge impact for us because under the old NCLB requirements, we were required to set aside 20% for uh, student supplemental services, and that was very targeted tutoring. And if you remember from Mr. Luzon's presentation two weeks ago, under this new waiver, we can use those 20% reserves to target all students who are not proficient, regardless of income level. And this doesn't change that? No, this actual, it is actually this waiver under NCLB that gives us the right to do that. Good. So for us, it's not a decrease in services, it's actually an increase in services. What is the timeline for the progress and performance index? The provisional data that you have just seen uh, would be released in June. It was released June 20th or 22nd on the Friday. Um, I think they were, didn't want to scare anyone. It was released Friday at 5 p.m., but anyways. Uh, the preliminary progress and performance index data, both annual and cum cumulative, that will include the 2012 MCAS, will be released sometime in August for school administrators and faculty to review, find discrepancies, whatever issues may be, and to begin planning. It will be official after all discrepancies are resolved because sometimes we're given students that don't belong in our district and there's other issues that can occur. The official results will be released in September and those will be our final progress and performance level classification. That is the end of the 10 slides on accountability. Questions? Mike? Uh, no, not yet. Rhonda? No. Ken? No. So, by definition, the perform they didn't say this, <laughs> the performance of the high school has more impact on the PPI than any other school. By definition. By definition, because of the seven indicators for the district. Exactly, mm -hmm. because the CPI and the SGP applies obviously to the high school, as well as um, the the cohort graduation and dropout rate. So, yes. if you have a, if your high school is doing well, the district overall stands a good chance of being rated well, and and the opposite is also true. Well, yes and no. By sheer mathematics, that should be true. But they've got the, other, the added caveat in their criteria that regardless of how well your high school is doing, the district is at the level of the lowest performing oh, school. Oh, I understand that part, yes. Yeah, I, I understand. Um, so that our high school could have continued at level one, we'd still be a level three district if the middle school remained in level two. I understand. Mr. Chair? Yes. Did any district go up? Based yes. on this, they did. Yes. Based on this formula, so it wasn't just a downgrade. No. For all districts, there are some districts that actually benefited from the change in the formula. Yes, and the reason some districts okay. benefited is because of that move to just one subgroup, the high needs subgroup, without a duplicated account, a duplicated counting of subgroups. So districts who had a large percentage of, let's say, English language learners who were also special ed students, who were also in a minority ethnicity and low income, those students were being counted four times. So those districts who had those multiple duplications 
of students were actually given an advantage by having one high need subgroup. Yeah, speaking. And then also districts that had improved in student growth were given a bump up. Although I care about absolute achievement and graduation rates and dropout rates, all of those measurements to me are arbitrary. Absolutely. The only thing I care about are SGPs. It's, it's the one piece of valuable data that they, the state produces, and if they just kept their computers humming and everybody else went home, I'd be happy. But Okay, thank <laughs> you. Yes, and if, if the progress and performance index was totally based on student growth percentile, I think it would be well to our advantage and well to our students' advantage because we'd be looking at absolute growth. But that's not the formula. I understand. Okay. All right, let's move into the educator's evaluation program. And one more cog in the wheel, if you will. And we're close to on time. The law and regulations for the new educators evaluation program is called 603 CMR 35. This was passed by the legislature and it is the law of the commonwealth. It is aligned with the requirements for the race to the top grant and one of the reasons why we received the NCLB waiver. So it is all connected. The new evaluation system is part of the big picture. Wareham was selected to be an early adopters district. We have had a labor and management committee that was formed in 2009 to look at supervision and evaluation. That committee has continued based on the good work of that committee. We were designated as an early adopter. We have had the training in this new system and we are continuing to work in that committee for full adoption with some adaption of the new program. Jan, I'm sorry, it just occurred to me as as I was reading this, this thing that you, you suggested might be a cure for insomnia, but one thing I forgot to mention to you is I noticed they reduced the number of students in subgroups from yes. 40 to 30. Yes. Can you tell me whether that will have any impact on Wareham? It most certainly will. Ah, then tell me, I'll tell us about it. Okay. I'm going to go back just a little bit here. Sorry to make you That's go back. okay. If you look at this slide, and I, that's one of the details I, I left out that it's I probably okay. should have kept in. It's okay. All right. They said this was part of a compromise with the federal government. In order to have one subgroup, they said you, then you need to have a smaller cap on the end on what the total number in that subgroup can be. Because in your unduplicated count of students, you're in incorporating a range of needs. Therefore, in order to have the wa receive the waiver, the feds and the commonwealth came to this understanding that a maximum group of 40 was too high, or a minimum group of 40 was too high, so they lowered the subgroup to 30. And why that impacts us is because it directly impacts more than any other school, the high school. Because where they may not have had 40 students who were special needs and 40 students who were in an ethnicity group and 40 students who were low income, they do have 30 students that are either or high, low income, special needs, English language learner, and um, ethnicity. So that is the direct impact, because when you put all the subgroups together, they're bound to equal at least 30 students. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. And I, and I want to pause here just a minute to say, please remember, as you're taking in all of these details, our teachers are, are being hit with all of this as well. So they're getting the training and doing the work of implementation at the same time. And I think it is a factor that we have to keep in mind that yes, it is the law, yes, it is the regulation, yes, we are required, but we also have to understand that this, for many veterans teachers, this is a whole new 
level of expectations and work and effort without ever changing a job. It is the law. This, we must implement this year fully uh, because we are a race to the top district, not just an early adopter. If you want more information on that, there is the URL. As I said earlier, we had begun this work in 2009. The idea of the new educator evaluation system is that it is continuous learning. It is a cycle of five components that is continuous and ongoing. It begins with self-assessment by the educator, and I use the word educator because every teacher and administrator, as you know, including the superintendent, is part of this law, is part of this new evaluation <coughs> system. You don't need to spend a lot of time on this because this is consistent with what we've already been through. Okay. And we have gone through it. And you've already gone through the five yes. steps of the yes. cycle. So I'm going to speed right through this. Great. Right. Uh, what you see here, I didn't rewrite the slides because I wanted you to see the same thing that we have already presented to teachers, and I believe, Mr. Sweat, you were in at least one of those training sessions with our teachers. So they could see a crosswalk, a comparison between the old system and the new system. The big change is that there are four standards of practice that teachers must meet, curriculum planning and assessment. So all that curriculum alignment that we talked about in those 25 slides is one of the standards in the new educational system. All of the instructional changes are in the second standard of teaching all students. Then, and those are the two most heavily weighted standards. Family and community engagement is the third standard. Professional culture is the fourth. Under the new system, no educator can receive an overall rating of proficient unless they are proficient in both curriculum planning and assessment and teaching all students. So there you see your connection. That's part of the law. Uh, in the old system, there were three ratings. In the new system, there are four ratings on the four standards. Exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, and unsatisfactory. In two years, there will be a comparison to student achievement that includes low performance, moderate performance, and high performance and teachers will receive both an overall rating on the four standards, and that will go into a graph pertaining to student achievement. But to be clear, PPI is not part of that, but SGP is. Correct. Okay. It is totally the impact on student growth percentile. And I have for each of you a copy of the chart. These four parents turning in, tuning in that they hear PPI, SBG, AYP. I, I have shared with the administrators that I think a recalcitrant middle schooler is up there coming up with these acronyms. Did I give you enough? Yeah. Okay. This is the chart. I'm just going to make sure I don't get the report because I go back down the steps. That is the chart, and I will confess that I don't know what macros were embedded in that. That is from the state, the DESE website, and I couldn't copy it and stick it in a slide. Uh, so that shows how this evolves in rating educators and looking at student performance. The, we're just, we're going to ignore the bottom of low, moderate, and high student performance because that does not go into effect for two years. But if you look at exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, and unsatisfactory, those judgments through multiple observations, through multiple measures of student growth and achievement, and all of the evidence that a teacher or an ed any educator brings forward to their evaluation, goes into determining on those four standards whether the educator is exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, or unsatisfactory. I object on principle to this, this thing that you just handed out. This notion that a teacher could produce high, especially over several years, 
high student learning. And that's literally ignored as a part of their performance evaluation is, is just absurd. Well, it won't be ignored in two years. Well, it, you mean they're going to change the table? No. The, the idea is that the, you're saying that they, it's high performed and it's ignored because if they're. Yeah, we put them on an improvement plan because, and because s some individuals think that they're not doing a good job, but that students just happen to be learning very well. Well, one of the things that is in the contract language is that if there is that kind of discrepancy when, when student achievement becomes part of the evaluation plan, then it is referred to a, a third party, whether it is another administrator or the superintendent, to look at that discrepancy and do their own observations of the teacher's That's exactly right, which is, which is why this, you know, trivial, uh, I should have a much better word that I won't use, uh, which is why this graph, table, whatever, cannot be used in the language we have almost negotiated with the evaluation committee is far superior. This should not be incorporated into our understanding with the WEA. That's what I'm saying. I think that if we could take the chart, cut off the bottom, and just look at the ratings based on the observations and the evidence, it gives us a far better picture of what kind of uh, educator plan and, and whether it's directed or self-directed needs to be in place. Fine, continue. So, I just had to make, put that on the record because it clearly doesn't make any sense. And it's, I, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. The big part of this process is goal setting. I want you to know our teachers have already begun the SMART goal process and setting goals. They will go back to those preliminary goals when they come back to school towards building their educator plans. Uh, the training has been in place and will continue with our administrators, instructional leaders, and department chairs in how to complete walkthroughs, how to write feedback on those walkthroughs and unannounced observations, as well as the formal announced observations. Jan, In, one yes. second. Go ahead. As part of the SMART goal planning for the teachers, um, is a measurement going to be uh, test scores and, and just scores, I mean, similar to the way that the schools that are coming in front of us showing their school improvement plan that they're looking at three, five, 15 percent increases in scores and uh, other pieces. I think the SP, what, which acronym? Is SGP. That? SGP. Um, is that an expectation um, in the classroom that um, that is going to be one of the rating points when, for the measurement? When we worked on SMART goals uh, and that training was provided for teachers, we provided it in collaboration with the WEA, with the Teachers Association. We went through multiple measures. They know that a SMART goal has to be measurable as well as attainable, as well as specific and time bound. Um, so they've learned all the components of SMART goals. The preliminary SMART goals that were done this year were looking specifically, by and large, at least the ones I've read so far, at the alignment side of curriculum and what they needed to do to align their instruction and their content with the new standards. Because every teacher has to have a goal of professional practice. So in their professional practice goals, that's what they looked at, by and large. There were some others, but that was a large percentage of it. Then they have to have a goal of student performance. And for the most part, what I have read so far, the measures they're looking at are student growth. They're preliminary. But I will say the teachers took it very seriously. Many of our teachers worked as grade level teams or as subject area teams, and they developed goals. In fact, I can tell you that the math department at the high school took this extremely seriously. And they looked at what their students had done, and they put in their goals of practice, alignment with the new mathematics standards, in their goals of student performance, 
they put in student growth as one of the measurements. Right. I just don't want to leave it up to chance, and ultimately this is the superintendent's um, decision, but if I had an opinion on this one, which I normally do, is that to basically set that expectation, that student performance, student achievement has to be a measurement across the board. It just it has to be in there, not leaving it up to chance and seeing what they come up with on what their measurement tool is going to look like. But the expectation is that you will have as one of your indicators of success student achievement or student performance. And I, I think that's a clearly understood. Um, part of the issue we have to remember is that less than 20% of our teachers have, at, have any kind of MCAS or standardized tests. So if you're not, but I know they have to use other about, measures. Exactly. Yeah, I, I don't care just about MCAS okay. or, but, but we have many, we've, we've seen presentations on it, all the different kinds of indicators that you are coming up with to be able to measure student performance and student achievement. Being able to come up with what are the best indicators that whether you're aligning, you're not aligning, that all of the work that we're doing at the end of the day, it's about student achievement, and so Absolutely. that needs to be a measurement. And if you look at this last bullet on this slide, and this was part of the teacher's training as well, and, and you know the date's there, is that it connects <laughs> the evaluation, instructional practice, and student growth and achievement. It's all connected. And one of the things that we're going to be working with all of the principals uh, and then all of the APs, ILs, and department chairs in August through our training is what are some of the benchmarks to look at in these goals? Because these are preliminary goals the teachers did. Now they're going to have to finalize them when they come back the end of August. So what are the benchmarks and expectation in those goals that the principals are going to have to look at? And they have to be the same across the district. There has to be consistency across the district. So you're absolutely right, and that will be part of setting criteria for administrators to look for in those goals. Because as was pointed out today in one of the meetings we were at, if those goals, or I think it may have been in our own conversations over lunch, that if those goals are not solid and they are not measurable, if they do not look at student growth and achievement, then the plans that the teachers or educators build are not going to be good and the results aren't going to be good. So the goals have to meet those criteria. Um, this is the cycle that the state has given us. Again, this is regulation. And in this cycle, we are expected to have all of our educators complete, having completed their self-assessment and goals by September. We are on target to do that. Uh, the educator plans, uh, we are looking at having those submitted in October. Then the implementation of the plan, there will be a formative assessment sometime January, February of both the observation data and the goal, the progress on goals, and then a summative evaluation in May or June. Uh, this is assuming an, a one-year plan uh, for teachers who, through previous observations, are on a two-year self-directed plan they would have a formative assessment in January, February, and a formative assessment in May, June, with a summative the following year. So it depends where they fall on that graph that you have as to when their summative evaluation is completed. That is the end of the 10 slides on the new educator evaluation system. If there are any questions. I'd be glad to address them now before I move into connecting it all together. Mike, Rhonda, Kat, continue. All right. This is, a, this is a very short section of the presentation because we've gone through so many details. I figured at this point in the evening, brevity was probably the best course of action. But I want to preface this by saying this is really the heart of it that unless we connect curriculum assessment, accountability, and evaluation as a whole integrated system, this teaching and learning system concept is just a concept. It's not an action plan. And this is where it has to become an action plan. So some of the plans as we're developing this and we're working this summer uh, as directors and superintendent and then we'll be sharing with our administrators, 
These plans have to be connected. They have to be implemented, monitored, and evaluated. Curriculum and professional development. We need to complete alignment with curriculum mapping with an increased focus on 912. Um, the superintendent had told me that, you know, to get ready, I would be spending a lot of time at the high school. So uh, we've, I've already begun working with department chairs. The reception is good. There's a lot of work still that they know we have to do together. We, I will continue and we will continue as a district for targeted supports with our instructional leaders as they serve as also the data team leaders so that they can guide their colleagues in their responsible grade levels, whether it's elementary, middle, or the department chairs at the high school, on how to look at the assessment data for instructional interventions and redesigns. It is RTI, but it's more than just response to intervention. It is also doing that ongoing assessment data and redesigning your instruction to provide for the differentiation that is needed for all students to learn. We will be using a focused embedded professional development with a train the trainer model where our teacher leaders, not just instructional leaders, but any teacher leader can be trained and then we'll share that training with colleagues. This will continue th through the alignment for both instruction, that's pedagogy, as well as content in the new standards. We are continuing with differentiated instruction and tiered interventions. As I mentioned earlier, our own uh, Lisa Williams, who is, the, who is a special education teacher here at the middle school and an adjunct professor at Simmons, will continue with the courses in universal design for learning. We will also be using some of our own teachers who have been trained in formative assessment, data and instructional design to provide that training with their colleagues. We are planning a balance between training sessions during our early release and in-service days with collaboration time because we know teachers need time to work on this, both during the school day as well as beyond, but we need to set aside time that is part of their school day, which would be early release. Our plans for 2012 and 2013 under accountability and district improvement include staff meetings and training. Um, I will be going to faculty meetings to explain the new progress and performance index and the new accountability system. And this is a major concern on my part that the teachers become aware of not only of this new system but have an understanding of it because those reports are going to be sent to parents in September. And as I said, it just came out in the end of May. So I don't want any of our educators to be caught unawares with a parent meeting with something that they haven't learned about. Um, there have to be family and student meetings regarding these reports and what they mean. We needed to implement the uh, conditions for school effectiveness assessment across the district. That is a requirement. We also need to analyze those results and develop a district improvement plan for FY13 based on any possible adjustments that are going to affect the school improvement plans. They're going to have to be revised with this new accountability system. We have to monitor and revise SMART goals with our teachers and teams and continue to inform families and staff of the new accountability system, as well as to continue to monitor the implementation of school improvement action plans and the educator plans. The educator's evaluation implementation includes in when teachers come back in August, they will have an opportunity during one of the in-service days. There's going to be some concurrent workshops but they will also have opportunity to review their preliminary goals and work on final goals based on the data they will have. In September, all of our teachers will be developing educator plans based on a template that is coming out of our Labor Management Committee. Those plans will be implemented on or about October 1st, or at some point in October, with formative assessments in December, January, and throughout the year, we will be doing walkthroughs with frequent feedback following a consistent format across the district. And then those summative assessments and review of educator plans in May and June. All of this will come together in a 
interrelated system that will increase student achievement over time. Is that a guarantee? <laughs> over that I believe we will increase student achievement. And I would guarantee that our student achievement will increase because we do have very competent and committed teachers who are going to implement these new standards. I cannot sit here and tell you to what level that increase will be or how long it will take us. I, I think this all working together, we could see some dramatic increases. But it's, I can't minimize the fact if we go back to that initial graphic way back at the beginning, that it takes everything to work together, and that includes the resources from our community and the Commonwealth, because without, we're not gonna hit the target. If we, we need, our teachers need the support and they need the resources as well as the training, as well as the monitoring, and all of that working together. But it, it's, it's going to take all of the above to be truly effective, and the rate of progress, I think, has a lot to do with not only these programs we're implementing, but the resources that are available to our students and our teachers. Yes. Jan, these changes that you presented tonight, how do they affect, I'm not going to say negatively or positively, but how do they affect um, RTI and whether we would need to, um, it might be too soon to tell, but um, generally, how would this affect RTI? Would we need to be able to invest more, um, less, or um, does it have no effect at all? RTI is part of the whole plan because the idea of response to intervention with tiered instruction is that differentiation. It is part of the universal design for learning. So it, it's, um, I can't say how does it affect RTI, because RTI is part of the change to adopt and be aligned with the new standards. Because remember, the new standards are content, which we've talked a lot about, but they're also instructional strategies. And one of those instructional strategies is tiered instruction and differentiation. Well, because I know with the instructional leaders mm -hmm. and with the new evaluation program and the accountability system. Those, I know that we're talking about curriculum and framework work and, and boosting up the, but I'm talking specifically around the evaluation program and the accountability system that, I'm, I'm probably answering my own question, it's too soon to tell, but if you do have that level of support mm -hmm. to be able to um, provide feedback to the educator in the classroom on what's going on um, and tweaking it. Is that the support that's needed? So then, uh, you know, or if it's just the needs and it's our students and we need to have RTI because of the demographics of, of um, the students, the population that we're serving, so. I think RTI goes beyond demographics, quite honestly, because regardless of the demographics of the students, Teachers need to gear their instructional strategies to the learning styles and needs of their students. And do the demographics require a greater level of uh, strategizing, a greater level of scaffolding? Yes. Uh, there's an article in um, the educator newsletter, the Harvard letter that comes out to educators on a monthly basis. It just, this article I just happened to be reading came out the end of June. And it went through the fact that students who are low income and come from families that have generations of low income and poor access to resources, whether it's community or state resources, start at a huge disadvantage that schools have to make up. Well, when you're talking about a literacy 
curriculum that has gone from the earliest grade level to 50-50 balanced approach, informational and fiction, you're demanding that your students have a frame of reference, have a, um, ha have a certain store, if you will, of awareness to be able to read informational text. And so, yes, demographics affect that because for many of our students, in the lowest grades, our teachers are having to build that frame of reference. They're having to backfill information that students have not gleaned from family or home environment. So yes, there is an increased need in that sense because we have to provide more for students who have not traveled widely, for students have ha who have not been exposed to a greater level of information or text or experience. Uh, on the other level, uh, the idea of matching your instruction to students' needs is true no matter where you are. So I'm, I know I'm answering your question uh, almost duplicitly by saying yes and no at the same time. Uh, so do we need RTI? Yes. Do yeah, we need to respond to students' needs? Yes. Thanks. Mike? Okay. all this is rolled out, do you see this as being a, a chance to get improvement in the middle school, which is, it seems like the middle school was the reason why you loved this lady for the last five years. Yes. I want to point out that the middle school has improved. Uh, when I was first interviewed for this position eight years ago, the writing sample that I was asked to do as an applicant was to analyze the MCAS results from 2003. In 2003, less than 40% of the students were scoring proficient on mathematics. Uh, it was higher in English language arts, but I remember mathematics in particular. And I asked the question afterwards, are these the real test scores? because I had not experienced results that low. So we had a huge deficit to make up in the middle school. Am I pleased with having almost 60% of our students proficient? No, it needs to be way higher. The only c case I'm making is that we need to do more in the middle school, and I think this but we've made some progress. Do we need to make more? Absolutely. And do I think that this new curriculum and these standards are going to increase the rate of progress? Absolutely. Because now the impetus is twofold, and that is on instructional strategies as well as content. And I think another thing that I have to bring out in this is that the awareness level of our teachers as to what to, they need to expect of students is very, very high. Um, Mr. Luzon are and I are going to be meeting uh, with uh, the uh, new president of the WEA who happens to be sitting here with a proposal of how the WEA can work with us to increase professional development and how we can um, address some of these needs that our teachers have. So I think everyone is well aware of what needs to be done. And I do think that the new standards are going to increase the rate of improvement. Thank you. We clearly, because we do it all the time and the state does it for us, have the organizational capacity to differentiate between the performance of our students. Do you believe we have the organizational competency to differentiate between the performance of our teachers? I believe we have the organizational competency, yes. So the fact that we're not doing it is a function of what? I'm going to quote Tony Wagner, who happened to be a trainer we brought in from Harvard on change leadership, I think about five years ago, if I'm right, Barry. And he talked just about this, the, the, to be an effective leader for change, what it took 
in monitoring teachers, in supporting teachers, in working towards student growth in learning. And he said the first thing you have to do is get rid of the niceness factor. And what he was referring to is the intrinsic need of educators, uh, and we're all guilty of this, of wanting to be supportive and maybe overly positive. And I think the best analogy I can draw is as a mother. When you have a toddler learning to walk, the first thing you want to do is pick up that toddler when he or she falls. The worst thing you can do is pick up that toddler when he or she falls. You're they not, have to not, learn. You're not truly drawing an analogy be between a professional teacher and a toddler. No, I'm not drawing an analogy between a professional teacher and a toddler. I'm drawing an analogy between the nurturing desire of a mother and the desire of an administrator to be supportive and nurturing and avoid the critical analysis. So this was something that was said to you and to others, I assume, five years ago. Yes. Okay. Five years have transpired. And we are not differentiating. Why is that so? I hope we didn't pay Mr. Wagner to come. Of course we did. I think we have seen a change and we've seen a level of accountability by many of our administrators. I think the rate of growth and change is in a large range. Where's the evidence of that? Where's the evidence of? This change in growth that you referred to. I think we can look at specific schools where we have seen improvement. No, I'm talking about differentiation. Among the evaluation I, I of, of I, faculty? I, I don't actually like the niceness phrase, but using yours, that's, or that's Mr. Wagner's phrase. Yes. Where's the evidence that people are now capable of differentiating? What I have seen in the summative evaluations and observations for this past school year that have been turned in, I have not read them all. The ones I have read, I have seen an increase in recommendations, very specific recommendations, on how teachers can improve their instruction and raise student achievement. I have seen an increase in the summative evaluations where teachers were rated as in progress in performing to standards. So I've seen an increase in administrators' evaluations as far as specifically targeting improvements, targeting, and recommending interventions that needed to be implemented. I would, I actually disagree with the state. They think that, not surprisingly, uh, they think that exemplary teachers should be rare. Yes. I actually think that we probably have quite a few in this district. I would absolutely agree with you. And I would you. love to, there to come a day, an evening, where we, those exemplary teachers are recognized and applauded and get the deserving attention that perhaps right now they only occasionally get a pat on the back. Um, but by the same token, while I wouldn't want an evening for this, I would hope that those that need an improvement are identified and that action is taken to make sure they understand how serious it is and that they must improve. But I frankly, don't see the evidence that you say exists and I'm looking forward to at some point seeing it because both are necessary in order to, and to be done well, if we're going to have this, with all due respect to Rhonda, this enthusiasm factor um, that I think is critical to getting people to take that hill which is called student achievement. I, I would agree with you and I think it, it, it is a big shift. It, it's teachers who are, it's also, I think, um, a reluctance, and that's probably not the best word, but a hesitation is probably, maybe better, 
description on the part of those exemplary teachers to be identified. And I think that that, that, is, an, that is maybe not the hill, but that's a knoll that needs to be overcome as well. And those exemplary teachers to be identified and to be teacher leaders, and we are using them to lead our vertical teams and to be members of this, this work that needs to be done. Um, but they are hesitant to step up and be recognized. Yes. But I think that if you have a true, a, an evaluation system that is practiced, that is implemented, that is adopted, that is, <laughs> that people are enthusiastic <laughs> about an evaluation system, then automatically uh, the exemplary teachers um, are recognized. And that's, that's what I think is just missing right now, is that um, we don't have an evaluation system. We have evaluation forms, we have an evaluation system. But a true evaluation system that again, you know, we, we had this debate before, but that it's not a negative. It's evaluating is not a negative. Evaluation, every single person in every aspect of their life, evaluation is actually a positive tool to um, know how you can get better, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think that um, I do believe that it's that um, uh, performance should be celebrated, good performance should be celebrated, and performance that um, needs a little bit of supervision and accountability um, is also recognized and um, and there are true plans put behind it that's where I think that you're going to get to student performance that you're you're going to be able to get your goals and I just I, these three steps that I see up here I want to believe in all of them and I and I I do believe that they will work but it's only if we truly um, adopt a, an evaluation system across the board and it's valued and it's recognized and it's used. And, and I agree with you. I don't think that an evaluation system any more than student assessment is the whole answer. No. But I think it's a p big critical piece of the answer just as it is one of these cogs because you can't improve student learning unless you know what they don't know. You can't improve instruction unless you know what's not happening. And I think that is one thing that this law does is we can adapt to a certain point, but the, the essence of that CMR 60335 must be adopted as of September 1 and must be implemented. And then it is up to us as central administrators to work with our principals, to our principals to work and have a consistent implementation of this new evaluation program. And I agree with you, it, it will be a critical piece of increasing the rate of student achievement. Thank you, Jan, for your obvious hard work and yeah. it's a yeah. huge undertaking that I know you're just in the middle of, of doing. So we appreciate your efforts and your being here tonight. Well, you're very welcome, and I look forward to bringing back news of results and ongoing efforts, and please know that at any time I'm available for any questions or inquiries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, we went over new business before you got here. Do you have any other new business that you'd like to bring before the committee? Okay, then I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We're adjourned. Wow. Surprise, aren't you? So 917.